Thank you, Scylla. Um, when Michael O'Leary did say that to me, when I actually finally met him, I did point out I didn't mind at all being called, called media lovey. I thought that was quite a compliment, but less of the old would have been quite good. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's very nice to be here and to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Um, I used to work in this building, so I have stood on here innumerable times talking to uh, journalists mainly, so, you know, familiar territory. Um, but uh, I, I just, I've been... I, Caroline and Tim kind of asked me to do this, and, um, and I thought about it, I thought, well, actually, this is a really important thing to do, because um, EasyJet actually has used advertising extremely effectively, and I just want to talk to you a little bit about that. But actually, when I went through the archives, I hope these slides are working, um, of uh, EasyJet advertising, um, I do have to ask, you know, why I'm here, because actually our contribution to creative development, really, has probably... Um, has it come up yet? Could you put the first slide up? Because I am pressing the button. Yeah. So you'll see how, um, how good our advertising has been. And, you know, the, I think this was called Weapons on the left here and Flip Flops for Faro. And actually, um, w one of the early things I was involved in with the EasyJet was the launch of our route to Jordan. And, um, and it was a very big deal because we were opening up Jordan for a lot of people who would never have dreamt of going there because of our low fares. And uh, the uh, government was there in full force, the Jordanian government, and the British ambassador was there, and we hosted this big evening. And he asked to see me in his armoured car at the end of the evening. And I thought, oh, God, this sounds really serious. So I jumped into the car at the end of the evening, and he said, Carolyn, there's just this matter that's very serious to the government uh, about your advertising. I thought, good, what? And he said, you know, camels we are really trying to move away from the stereotype <laughs> in Jordan. Um, and I had to point out to him with great relief, Peter Duffy had just joined, actually, and he was in Jordan, which we'd taken him to show him how we do stuff like that. And I, I said, look, don't worry, we are now on a different kind of path as far as advertising and communication is concerned. So as I said, I've been asked to talk for a few minutes, uh, 10 or 15 minutes, about um, our approach to brand and to communication. And I guess it could be summarized very simply as... Uh, very commercial. Um, at the heart of running uh, a low-cost business is a philosophy that you only spend money when it is absolutely necessary or where it drives a return. And the only exception to that, the one thing we're never low-cost about, as you would expect, is safety. So what this means is that everyone at EasyJet understands that a low-cost space is absolutely essential to offering low fares. That's the reason we can offer low fares. So the airline today, as in its beginning, aims to deliver... Uh, customers the lowest prices on every route we fly. That's what we really try very hard to do. Um, now, you may remember that our original founding principle was to make flying as cheap as buying a pair of jeans. Well, that still stands. Price is at the heart of our proposition, and that is why you rarely see a piece of communication, probably never, from EasyJet without a lead-in price. So much has changed, really, um, but uh, some things haven't. So that um, is, is kind of core to the concept, really. Um, to give you just a quick flavor of the company, I'll just describe where the majority of our people who are land-based work. Uh, this is Luton. This is Hangar 89. It truly is a hangar. We share the hangar with a couple of Airbus uh, 320s who tend to come in and get serviced on a regular basis. Um, you know, really, the office bit is, is, is a bit of staging at the front. It's very orange. Uh, it looks a bit like B&Q. I think when Ian joined, you know, I think he did say it looked like B&Q without the merchandise. Um, we all sit on great big banks of desks. I mean, it is not a, a pretense. I mean, a lot of people come into the hangar. A lot of suppliers come into the hangar. Um, but, you know, there are no plants. There's no this, there's no that. It, it is a very functional environment. But actually, we do manage costs to the penny, not to the pound. And we, we just, you know, that is a philosophy that is just completely ingrained uh, in the business. Um, and I think one of the things that really does, the, this kind of lean thinking is a really big part of the brand positioning and also the organizational philosophy as I've described it. Because stripped of the kind of really nice things to have, our people don't get confused about where the priorities really are. Uh, in practice, though, this often means we're at the vanguard of innovation because in taking out cost, um, and we, we kind of look at it and we say there are lots of legacy processes around. And essentially, essentially that's about how other people do things. Um, we actually have to innovate um, in order to be very lean and efficient. So an example of this is that we're working on 100% online check-in. Of course, you know, this is great value to the airline because if you don't have to have loads and loads of check-in stands, you're going to be saving money. But it's also massively 
uh, valuable to the customer because it's easy, it's quick, it's efficient, it's less hassle at the airport. A lot of people don't like airports. So we already have about 50% of customers with just hand baggage that goes straight to security. By isolating this one issue, what we're going to try and do is completely re-engineer how you drop your bags off if you have a bag. And we will make it very, very efficient and therefore very easy for you. So uh, basically, you know, we just have to innovate all the time about kind of the low-cost philosophy. And it just becomes, I think, a virtuous circle because we can then do low fares for passengers. Um, so when it comes to marketing, um, I think you just... It's the same concept, really. The same concept applies. Um, over the last two years, what we've, uh, we have relaunched our advertising. I hope you've all seen that across Europe. Um, and we've used the full media mix. Um, but actually, I, I don't know how many people in this room will want to hear this, actually, but we have reduced our budget by 15%. But actually, we've been much, much more effective. I and mean, we still spend a lot of money, over 50 million on advertising. It's a very significant spend for us. So actually, the efficiency behind it has been really important, and I'll just talk a little bit about that. Um, when I joined um, EasyJet, it was in July 2010, and the aviation market was going through a huge amount of change. Uh, and and most, the, the rapid pace of change was driven really by high fuel, uh, because when you have f high fuel, it's very expensive to fly. And if you're an airline that doesn't have um, a good balance sheet, you have quite a lot of debt, it makes it very difficult indeed for you. But a lot was changing because the legacy carriers were having to, as Gavin will know because he sits on the BA board, uh, BA have brilliantly cut their costs, I mean really brilliantly. And they've become much more low cost in their philosophy about short haul flying um, than actually a lot of other legacy carriers. But everybody was restructuring. All the legacy carriers were coming more towards low cost. And then there was the emergence of loads and loads of low cost airlines as well. So when, you looked at, when I looked at EasyJet, I kind of thought, well, Everyone knew exactly what EasyJet was um, 10 years ago. It was a fantastic concept. I mean, it was a brilliant founding idea. It was a brilliant thing. And it really did change the way people flew. So everybody in the UK in particular knew what it was. And I think you move on into this kind of much more cluttered aviation world. And I think consumers were very confused about what EasyJet was. They were kind of, they didn't know whether it was, you know, very low fares or ultra low cost. Or was it like, you know, I got told all the time, people used to say to me, EasyJet, oh, that's really interesting. That's a lot better than Ryanair. I used to think, well, that's not really a compliment. So, um, so, you know, that really told me that our positioning was slightly off because actually EasyJet could do a lot very well. It was a very friendly airline. The crew were always very friendly. So there was something there. So actually, one of the first things you know, I did was I wanted to get a really strong uh, marketing director, someone who really understood consumers and was able to do uh, a lot with data and was able to also do a lot with brand. So Peter Duffy joined in March 2011, I think it is now. Um, and so we started really focusing on um, improving the whole end-to-end -end customer experience with a warmer, more friendly approach. I said a hundred times, it doesn't cost anything to smile on the ground. It doesn't cost anything. You just have to smile and look helpful, you know. Um, we've always had very helpful and friendly crew, as many of you, I hope, have experienced. Um, but we really needed to do that with our ground staff. And there, were, there are 18,000 ground staff, so it's a, it's a huge challenge. Um, we also had to absolutely, before we did anything else, we were doing this in parallel with, with really pushing hard our punctuality. We had in 2010 a massive problem with our on, what is called on-time performance. Um, and I'm very pleased to say, you know, it took about nine months to fix that. But until we fixed that, we couldn't do all the other, we couldn't market really anything that was uh, uh, different. And our positioning was always going to suffer. Um, as a result of it. So we're now industry leading on uh, what they call OTP, on-time performance. So once we'd fixed that, we, we could then start marketing all the kind of very tangible things that we had been developing. The new mobile app, which really gives passengers uh, up-to-date, uh, timely information, but really relevant information to them about their flights. Um, allocated seating um, and um, the whole uh, business uh, flyer proposition. So, you know, we don't have separate classes or anything like that, but we have got a proposition that if you are flying on business, you can be very quick and very efficient. You fast track through, speedy boarding, fast track, extra leg room. Um, you know, there, there are things we can tell you about the airport. We can get your train ticket at the other end. There's all sorts of things we can just do online that makes it very easy. We do a flexi fare now, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we started, we are now marketing all of those things because we are able to, because we can do it from a platform of strength. 
But if the main objective for us was to change people's perceptions of EasyJet from a discount brand to a consumer champion brand, then the communication with customers had to change. So essentially, our new advertising marks out a more emotional territory, um, which is a world apart, really, from our former price and kind of destination-focused uh, advertising, predominantly priced. It's based on the idea of reframing the airline from simply transporting people from A to B to connecting people to great experiences all across Europe quickly and easily. Um, however, and more importantly, we've looked not to just to transform the communication, but as I said, we've touched all of the touch points along the whole customer journey, from booking to the airport experience, to how our pilots and crew actually connect and interact with passengers, um, has been looked at and amended. And I think the airline has really embraced the kind of new brand. They're very pleased with it. They really like it. Um, before this, marketing was really about media, and there was very little focus on customers. Uh, media investment was focused on direct response, which whilst not an unsuccessful formula, wasn't one that would change perceptions and establish a brand positioning with affinity that would drive enhanced commercial success. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that has been a really, really uh, big change. And one of the things that is worth just bearing in mind as a PLC is that we have to make any changes we do in marketing in the context of a quarterly reporting period. So we have to maintain sales all the time. So we can't ever take a blip on something to trial it. Uh, in order to kind of move forward in the future. That, that's an important uh, context. Um, so just a quick uh, amount on what we actually did. Firstly, a very rigorous process of focusing on natural search and then testing and refining PPC and online display so we could drive us efficiency savings without impacting all overall sales. That's how we save the money. That's how we save millions. Secondly, a massive focus was put on our digital channels and how we could improve the level of conversion of existing traffic. So by optimizing conversions at the purchase end of our sales funnel, our media budget could be diverted to the channels that would help fill the top of the funnel. We've really done a lot from investing in advanced uh, content management system uh, to mobile and modern web management techniques and tools. And a good example of this is something that was invented in house by a very small team of people at a very low cost called Inspire Me. So if you could just play this video, it's just worth looking at because it describes it. So the reason that's been really fantastic for us, it's driven a huge amount of extra sales, is because most people that come to our website know exactly where they want to go. We were missing the browser market entirely. And that was aimed at people who just are young, free, and single, and can go wherever they want, anytime they want. So they just come in and say, either on price or whatever, you know, just give me a destination. So it's worked really well. But where it's really clever is when we combine it with CRM. So we emailed a few weeks ago, just as an example, all customers who traveled with us last February half term but haven't rebooked with us, showing them where they could go this half term, from the local airport, from their local airport. But actually, we tailored the message and inspire me to start at prices that were actually less than they paid 12 months ago, and we told them that. And that really is quite clever, because that's, for me, CRM at its very best. So, um, and we've had a fantastic response on that. So lots and lots of effort 
by our marketing team that all in all meant that promotional budgets could be redeployed to be spent on television-based, yes, test television-based brand building. I've spent years saying not so much TV, but TV-based brand building, also outdoor and social media, essentially creating emotive connections as well as driving sales. Um, and one of the most important things I think we've done with all of this stuff that I've been talking about, and Peter Duffy has been absolutely instrumental in helping me a huge amount with this internally, is that we've brought the brand to life internally. And one of the ways we've done that, it's actually a very dry slide that doesn't quite capture the kind of passion and enthusiasm that this instilled in the airline, which is we just did loads and loads of what you would call focus groups with pilots and cabin crew and M&A management admin people and engineering people, loads and loads of them. And then um, and we just said, look, what do we, why do we do all of this? You know, what do we do it for? And this is what they came up with. This is, you know, we want to make travel easy and affordable. The affordable thing was a very important reason of, for people at EasyJet, working at EasyJet, is a, you know, opening up markets, letting people travel, all of that. So um, that is what the cause is. And we use it every day, all the time. And it spawned a number of initiatives, including one that is very close to my heart, which is a customer charter, which I think really lives the brand. So again, I'm just going to show you, it is a two minute film on this, which is what we've used this internally to get everybody behind this customer charter, um, because it's their customer charter. And what we will next do is before the summer, we'll launch it to all our passengers and potential passengers. Can we just play this short film, please? Now, that looks really easy. I cannot tell you how hard that was to get off the ground in the airline. So Will Facey over there, the grumpy one, you know, who is, has all the information for the airline. He runs the operational control center. Honestly, he now is a believer, but it took a while. It took quite a long time. So actually, we're really, I'm really, really, because I think that is about the brand. That is kind of living the brand every day. So what's happened as a result, very quickly in conclusion, we still have a very long way to go, but the green shoots are definitely coming through. 
We have a uh, very strong brand awareness in our markets, all our markets in Europe, um, and consideration is continuing to grow. Um, we've always been strong in the UK, so we've had roughly 75% consideration in the UK. That's grown, but it's always been quite high. But most importantly for me, it has grown in both France and Italy, both very important kind of markets for, for EasyJet. Consideration there is now 65% and 59%. Um, but equally important to me, one in five consumers in those markets consider EasyJet to be their first choice airline. And that compares with just a year ago, uh, less than one in 10 would say that. So in, on smaller budgets, every media pound spent on our campaign has generated over four pound in profit. Now when you think that EasyJet, I know we're very profitable, but we actually only make five pound profit per seat. Five pound profit, and that was only this year. You know, So that is a really tangible contribution to what we do. And these stats are all great, but what really, really lets me know that this brand strategy is working is the passenger emails I now get. And I got this one very recently. I hope I can read, actually I can't read it. Ian, can you read it? I've only got one lens in, actually. Um, I have flown a simulator with one lens in, so I thought I could actually do a speech with one lens in. Would you read that out oh, for me, please? Sorry. Is it all right if I say who sent it? Say, because it's a real okay, email. Okay. It's from Patrick. Okay, so uh, this is from someone called Patricia Sutcliffe. Um, I hope you do not mind me taking the liberty of emailing you direct, but I wanted to tell you how impressed I was to travel with your airline for the first time. As a frequent flyer, I've been spoilt by traveling with some of the best airlines in the world, Singapore and Emirates to name but two. I have to admit, I've always avoided the budget airlines until last week when I found that Esp Wright, uh, which is a Lapland holiday company, had chartered EasyJet to take us to Ivalo. I boarded the plane with my family, having been impressed at the speed of check-in and the friendliness of your staff. On board, I was pleased to find the seats comfortable and staff equally friendly, efficient, and attentive. My experience has changed my mind totally, and I give you every credit you every credit in your achievements and would like to pass on my comments I would like you to pass on my comments to your staff I will now look towards EasyJet for short flights knowing that whilst you may be a no frills airline you're most certainly a caring airline many thanks Pat Sutcliffe B Ed M A P G Dip M P G Dip M A <laughs> F I P D and Mensa um, and I have to say I have to say, you know, two and a half years ago, you know, when everyone was saying to me, well, yeah, at least you're better than Ryanair, I could not have, that is, I could not have dreamt of getting an email like that. So, you know, that really shows me that, you know, the brand strategy is clearly working. So it just leads me to some concluding thoughts uh, very much about this conference. I just don't see how uh, a business can be successful without marketing without a clear positioning understood internally, as you saw, and also understood by customers and potential customers, um, without a, communi a communication program that is appropriately targeted at building long-term brand equity and also incremental sales. Um, you know, at EasyJet, it is quite extraordinary for me to see that the marketing director is treated with great respect, actually, by the CFO. Uh, my CFO loves working with Peter Duffy, um, and so does the ops director. It is quite, because normally they're not natural allies in an organization. And I think it's because they really get the fact that marketing contributes to our bottom line, that it contributes to our profit per seat, and it contributes to our Roki targets. And, and, and they all get, and I think that's really, really important. So, you know, marketing is run as part of an overall commercial strategy. It's not something that sits on the side. It, 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 it is something that is absolutely aligned with what we're trying to achieve with the core airline. And I think that is probably why it makes such a difference in EasyJet. So um, uh, I think that's it for me. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to your questions. Sarah, good morning. Um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, to participate in this event, uh, focused on the relationship between advertising and the wider economy. Because Channel 4 is a not-for-profit broadcaster, funded independently, not via the taxpayer. Our job is to spend as much as we can on original UK content that delivers to the remit that's been given to us by Parliament. So advertising is both our lifeblood and our oxygen. Now, I've spent almost 30 years in uh, advertising-related businesses, and in that time, I've observed that marketing has become progressively more uh, efficient as media platforms have emerged 
uh, competed uh, and evolved technologically. Now, the central challenge facing broadcasting in 2013 is how best to navigate through one of its most radical periods of change as the main screen in the living room gets directly connected to the internet. It's going to fundamentally change the viewer experience, the measurement systems, and the way we value audiences in the future. So today I'm going to talk a bit about plans we at Channel 4 have in 2013 to operate in this new environment. But first, I have been asked to talk a little bit about how we behave as an advertiser ourselves. Of course, we mainly promote our shows on air, but we do amplify messages with off-air campaigns produced in-house and placed uh, via our partners at OMD, deploying different media to deliver extra reach and context. And I think it's worth us celebrating the strengths of all of the media on an occasion like this. For example, shows like uh, Funny Fortnite that we did last uh, summer, or of course, uh, Homeland, uh, and uh, the Killing Fields project that we did, uh, they all featured strikingly dramatic visual imagery that deployed posters. Now, of course, digital posters offer uh, us as a, as a broadcaster an opportunity to be very specific about transmission times or even uh, very specific news stories uh, that are going on that night um, or to catch c uh, commuters on, on their way home uh, for shows like, uh, like Black Mirror that we also think is the next uh, slide coming up. Now, perhaps one campaign that best exemplifies our creative approach in terms of creative risk-taking was the 2012 Paralympic Games that was mentioned earlier, Channel 4's biggest ever campaign in our entire history, a hugely risky and ambitious project promoting a sport that at the time had a low public profile, and it was by no means guaranteed to attract large audiences coming straight off the Olympics. Our campaign capitalized uh, on the end of the Olympic Games with the thanks for the warm-up uh, cheeky poster campaign, and then we launched the critically acclaimed uh, Superhumans uh, poster and uh, trailer. We ran the trailer across 78 uh, TV channels, which was a first. We also convinced the BBC to run it at the end of the Olympics, which was another first, and over 2,000 poster sites, which generated a huge amounts of interest. All of which, of course, ultimately contributed to the Paralympics reaching new heights as a sporting event and becoming one of the biggest audience events in Channel 4 history. A wonderful partnership also with BT and Sainsbury's, and a real example of how advertising was used to change perceptions and to focus an entire nation on something that really we hadn't engaged with before. As I said, each new medium has its own creative strengths. For example, to mark our 30th anniversary last year, we ran this long-form press ad, uh, because in my view, great writing is too often neglected as a way to tell a great brand story in engaging detail. Especially, of course, when you've got Lord Grade as the star and the copywriter is a Booker Prize-nominated novelist. Now, an interesting footnote, uh, we, did, we were a little concerned as to whether or not any of the newspapers would balk at running uh, this ad. Thankfully, uh, all of them took our money, apart from one, I can't mention it, but it went all pink on us, uh, uh, and it decided it couldn't run the ad on the grounds that it was far too rude for their delicate readers. God bless them. Um, now, television has remained remarkably resilient, uh, more so than many future gazers expected, but it is going, as I said, through an exciting period of evolution in which its power to enhance brand awareness, which has been known for, is being augmented with an equal ability to connect directly with consumers. Now, after I arrived at Channel 4 in 2010, I made the observation that data was becoming the new oil in media. And since then, we have been in a major phase of building internal capacity and external connections at Channel 4 in the area of data. By the end of 2012, we have had over six million people registering with us, far exceeding our expectations. A staggering one in three of all 16 to 24 year olds have now registered with us in the UK. We've been adding 10,000 registered users per day. They're able to enjoy our extensive online catch up offer. In 2012, 4OD delivered near, nearly half a billion streams with over 70 hours of weekly catch up and 5,000 hours 
of archive content, as well as exclusive content and recommendations for registered viewers. 4OD, an increasingly powerful platform in its own right. From the outset, we have been able and been clear with our viewers through our viewer promise that's been widely uh, publicized about how we will use the data. And we've reminded them of the relationship between our free-to-air model, uh, at, which is not-for-profit, and the great content that they can enjoy with us. And our experience is proving that the audience has an appetite to share information in return for great content. This year, we'll be focusing not only on increasing the sheer number of registrations, for example, rolling out our registration on platforms beyond channel4.com, but driving further engagement in content amongst registered users. We already know that 60% of 4OD views on channel4.com come from logged in registered users, but we wanted audiences to further reap the viewing benefits of interacting deeply and to use these greater insights to further enhance our offer to advertisers. So during 2012, we worked with a number of blue chip clients to trial new data-led approaches to advertising. We partnered with brands to merge their databases with our own to match shared customers and recreate client segments, allowing us to offer video on demand packages specifically targeting individuals and then to track post viewing purchase behavior to measure return on investment. We launched eight new digital ad products which provide advertisers with even more opportunity to engage with our audiences. One of the most popular interactive formats is Ad Elect, which enables viewers to choose between creative executions of an advert. Brands such as Cadbury's, L'Oreal, Procter & Gamble, and Adidas are just some of the companies that have taken advantage of Ad Elect. And our research shows that users who choose which ad to watch are twice as likely to click through to the advertiser's website. Many other brands have carried campaigns through our additional digital products, such as Ad Social, which offers viewers the option to like, check in, or recommend or follow a brand. Ad Interact, which delivers pre-roll advertising with an interactive element, such as competitions or coupon registration, without leaving the player page. And Ad Pause, which shows a full screen static ad each time a viewer presses pause. Building on this progress in 2013, we'll be taking further steps to provide deeper insights about our audiences to advertisers through a second wave of ad innovation. So we will be in a position to start offering specific target audience groups on 4OD. For example, the targeting of known as opposed to modeled 16 to 34 adults. In short, advertisers will be able to focus on people rather than just audiences and we will be able to exploit advertising interaction data, effectively allowing advertisers to target people known to be in specific categories based on previous user engagement and actual behavior. We want to be able to make more handshake introductions between databases, seeking to match the database we hold with information brand holders have increasingly clearly uh, about their own consumers. And we can do this at a much deeper level than has ever been possible before because of the investments that we have been making, whilst doing so on an anonymized basis. This year, we will also launch one of our most exciting innovations to date, Adapt. This will allow advertisers for the first time to provide targeted ads to logged on 4OD users based on their age, their gender, and their location using Channel 4's user database. This means that different people uh, based in different parts of the country will receive a bespoke digital version of the same ad on 4OD. So say an ad for a national department store is called up, Adapt will recognize a user's data to deliver a version of that ad with content tailored to that particular person, such as targeted products or a local store promotion. Channel 4 is the first broadcaster to offer this kind of targeting on digital video on demand campaigns and expect much more from us in 2013 as we continue to make the data vision a reality both on the second screen and in shorter form formats too. We believe that these developments signal a very exciting opportunity ahead of us, a way of refreshing the virtuous circle of advertising as a means to fund great content in a connected world. 
were currently focused on on-demand viewing. But over time, as connected viewing becomes more widespread and reaches the main TV screen through products such as UView, we believe we'll be able to roll out these innovations across the majority of TV viewing. In its first few months, UView is already proving itself to be extremely popular with consumers who have it in their homes, and we expect it to grow at a reasonably healthy pace in 2013. What's also growing is 4.7, which launched last year, and uses immediate social media reaction as a way to present the most talked about new shows from Channel 4 from the last seven days. But all this innovation is, is of course, exciting, but our core skills as a linear broadcaster also require us to keep investing in great content. Last year, we spent uh, almost to a record level of 600 million pounds, 450 million of that on UK originated content. So I'd like to end by thanking all of the advertisers and agencies in the room for your investments, and in a moment, by showing you some of the highlights from the start of 2013. Our portfolio has begun the year well, after the best Christmas ratings on Channel 4 in a decade. In 2012, E4 enjoyed its best ever year, and the portfolio as a whole had a share of 11.5%, practically level with 2011, despite the Olympics and the Jubilee. Now, interestingly, by contrast, Sky One, despite all the recent investments and digital switchover, is no longer a top 10 digital channel for either individuals or ABC Ones, whilst E4, Film4, More4, and Dave all are. 10 years ago, Channel 4's share of commercial impacts was just above 18%. It might surprise you to learn that the Channel 4 portfolio of channels in 2012 also had a share of commercial impacts of just over 18%, a remarkably stable performance in a digital world. And through our sales partnership with UK TV and PBS, we now deliver 27% of total adult impacts in the UK. So despite all the developments of the last decade, Channel 4 is still the market leader for delivering young and light viewers with original, high-quality uh, content. So let's now take a look at what's coming next in 2013.